standard attitude indicator right in front of the pilot, like it should be. But they had the standby attitude indicator down here, and that turned out to cost an airplane. And that was the St. Martin Carnahan incident where they had a problem. I'm not sure what happened, but the, something happened so that the airplane went into a turn, but the ADI did not indicate that it was in a turn, the, the attitude indicator. And so uh, the airplane just went like that at Mach 3, and, uh, and then it's gone because it just disintegrated. So they moved the, uh, the standby attitude indicator to uh, right on top of the main ADI so that if one, you could see them together. And if, if one was cocked off, then you knew to look around and see what's going on. It's flying the airplane, especially at night. And this is at night, the, 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 the Carnahan. Flying at night, you have no reference. You know, stars look like lights on the ground. And there's no reference if you can't see the horizon. So it's just like flying in a, in a big sphere of light. So you need that. So uh, Tom Tilden was a big uh, mover to get a laser attitude warning system. So the later airplanes, uh, starting about eighty five or so we had a laser projector on the right uh, console that would project a laser line over the cockpit over the instrument panel independent uh, gyros and so it mimicked and you could change the uh, illumination whether it's bright or dim and you could change the position of it because one thing we found out is as a laser goes over a, a switch that uh, maybe the paints off of it, it oh gosh a big flash so you, you turn this thing down a little bit it was never meant to be an attitude indicator but only an indication that something is wrong so if you're flying along and your attitude indicator looks okay but then you see this laser going like that that's another cue so you need you need cues about something about going out of control as soon as you can get them. this laser was one that that would do that so that was one the other thing is that we put a four inch standby ADI on top of the regular. So now you've got a big ADI, you've got two big ADIs, <laughs> one big and the other a little bit smaller, plus the laser. And all that, ended, as we started flying at night a lot more, the powers that be wanted us to fly uh, the uh, North Korean uh, sorties at night. Just sticking with that, uh, the, the ergonomics just for a minute then, because I think we'll, we'll talk about the operational missions probably in, in in our next interview which you haven't agreed to yet but we're gonna definitely gonna have to have it because this one this is just going way over in time uh, so, so the tdi was that an innovation a triple display indicator what what were the three things that were showing you why was what, what you know why, what was special about tdi altitude mock and uh, yeah, not so good near speed they were all supposedly without error and they had their own little special computer and i, I never knew one to know but um, looking at your airspeed indicator is worthless at eighty thousand feet because uh, if you ever have your uh, flight computer handheld flight computer and looked on the back the f tables well the f tables are for high altitude flight and they're off the chart so you could have an indicated airspeed of uh, 500 knots but your dynamic pressure is really only 320 okay? so you, you can't look at your indicated airspeed and there's no direct reading of, of uh, you'd have to have another checklist to go well what's my indicated and what's my equivalent so they just built the thing through engineering i was talked to kelly johnson one time i had the privilege of talking to him twice and i asked him a technical question about the sr-71 and his answer i think to get rid of the pest was it's engineering it's engineering <laughs> so i'd just say the same thing it's engineering that's how you did it Excellent. If, if i ask you a question and, and you that's how you respond i now know that uh, you're trying to get rid of me okay he was a wonderful man he, he came down to our reunions and uh, he spoke uh, to us several times and i just gosh he, what a what a man he was and you, you probably know a lot about him don't you well i, re I read his uh, his autobiography and ben riches uh, and of course i've you know i've i've sort of spoken to a few people who met him but uh, I, I would you know I would love to have interviewed him that would have been did he, did he fly the SR do you know I think he had one flight in one ride, uh, that, that was what I was going to ask yeah, there, there's a on the, in the, in the, uh, on the internet there, if you google SR-71 crew members or something you see a list of all the crew members that have ever flown the SR-71 and the VIPs they say and his name isn't on the list and I, it's always kind of I'd heard that he did and there's a picture of him in the cockpit with a, a, a face mask on I don't think he flew you know, at Mach 3, but he, I think he flew in the pattern. Somewhere. So automation-wise then, the spikes, the inlets, uh, have uh, an automated element to them. Uh, you've mentioned an autopilot that doesn't hold altitude, but you can set an attitude in. Uh, what, what other pilot relief systems are there? And uh, what, what else did they put in to make the airplane as sort of less stressful as possible for you to, to fly? That's about it. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, it was, so, the airplane. I can tell you that my I 
studied my physiological reaction to the airplane. And I came to a, a conclusion, and I'm sure it's 100% correct. Would you like to hear it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sometimes we would fly long missions, you know, three or four refuelings. The longest I ever flew was five refuelings. It was 10 and a half hours. That is a tough job. It is to be, I mean, five refuelings, 10 and a half hours, and you have to be aware of everything that's going on the whole time. So it is mentally exhausting. Sitting in a, in a it is a rather comfortable chair, but being strapped into any chair for 10 and a half hours is not going to be comfortable. But it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, my muscles weren't tired. It was just I was tired. Well, what I realized, oh, okay, another thing is the, the, the symptom. I come down from a flight like that and I'm dead tired. What do I want to do? I, I like to lie down and go to sleep. I lie down, I can't go to sleep. I'm too wired. I'm just, I can't. I go, huh. What I would do is, is go for a walk and I'd walk for two to three hours fast. And that, that would be enough. And then I realized what happened is that every time there was hiccup, anything, that was going on, I could feel a shot of adrenaline. You ever felt that adrenaline? It's like, oh gosh. Oh my. So at the end of 10 hours, I have no more adrenaline. It's all been shot in my body. So I'm wired up with adrenaline. That's what it is. And there's no other way to do that on the ground. Unless, so I'm sure that's what it was. And so I, I knew then that at the end of a long flight, I say long flight, three refuelings or more, we usually Count them by the number of uh, hot legs and three feelings. Then I just uh, just walked and, and dissipated that, and it was okay. Did uh, so. We, we talked in the last interview about the effects of ox breathing oxygen for a long time. You you, said, you know it sort of dries out your ear and uh, can give you a bit of a of earache. Uh, what about the bends? Then is that something that ever affected you or or, or a crew that you were aware of? It, it affected me in the U two. One time I, I wore it in the A model, um, I wore a partial pressure suit, which is a, uh, it's a torture device is what it is. And you've seen, seen those where that you see this, the tube running down the side and, and it, instead of uh, protecting your body with uh, increased air pressure, it protects your body by increased material pressure and it squeezes on your body. Well, every time I flew the U2 at, at high altitude, which is most of the time, I would come down and have a blood vessel broken right in my elbow because you have to move the elbow and this thing. It was just uncomfortable. And I did feel the bends one time. The bends are the scratchy feeling and everything. And we didn't fly that high in U2, 70,000 feet. But I mean, you're, if you're at 45,000 feet, you can get the bends. I came back and reported to the flight surgeon and uh, I was okay. So it just, it just went away. Not in the SR. Now we had one, one crew member who was in his upgrading. He just come from the simulator and it was like his first or second flight in the airplane. And uh, he didn't properly uh, fasten his faceplate. So it's halfway open. And, you know, oh, the other thing is that the SR-71 was not pressurized at 10,000 feet. Uh, it was pressurized at 26,000 feet at high altitude. So you're flying at 26,000 ambient in the cockpit. Well, guess what happens at 26,000 feet if you're not breathing oxygen? <laughs> you get hypoxic. So he got hypoxic, and that's the only physiological incident that I know of. Uh, he, uh, he was flying. He was in the front seat, and the IP was in the back, and the IP talked to him and didn't get an answer, and, you know, that's kind of alarming. So he <laughs> shouted at him, and the other guy, oh, I'm okay. Oh, I'm <laughs> so the IP <laughs> took the airplane and descended and came back subsonic. By the time he got down to 10,000 or so, he was okay. But that was that was worth a few drinks in the bar, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I do I do wonder, obviously you can't answer this question directly, but maybe you can r relate the, the stories that you've been told. But what the experience was like in the back seat then? Because not only are they not in control but the uh, the rso had these tiny little windows didn't they you know i i've heard on, on the camera and the you know, the pr9 they, they used to call them day night indicators i don't know if they do they did the same in the in the sr community but that's all they were really good for uh, and, and things like unstarts and uh, you know sort of the the violence of that how that worked especially if you're sort of you know you're you're busy doing your job and then suddenly there's this terrifically violent event and, and what that must do to your nerves yes well they uh, they definitely had the you know, harder of the, the more difficult of the two missions all i had to do was fly the airplane and it, it was i mean it was enough to do that but he had to uh, talk on the radio run the checklist run the sensors run the defensive systems make hf reports we had vhf uhf and, VA, and hf they had to make hf reports everyone on operational missions and uh, he had to and running the checklist is not i mean you're running the checklist that's not a trivial exercise he had to know the checklist he had to know, uh, he had to tell me where every circuit breaker was if I didn't know it myself. And like Jay Reed was, was right there. 
If you enjoyed this clip and want more, you can go to 10percenttrue.com, hit subscribe, and get early ad-free access to all my content. Appreciate your support.